Hi, this is Josh back here with Fight Bad Medicine. Today we're going to talk about how you can fight inflammation, reduce inflammation. So first of all, let's talk about what inflammation is. So whenever you fall, you get a bruise or a cut, a gash, you're going to have white blood cells go into the area, increase blood flow. And so it's going to get red, hot, swollen, and that's only because your body is responding with, with its immune system, with natural killer cells, with cytokines, and just because it's trying to fight those bacteria and viruses that are invading, that's a good thing. That's what we call localized inflammation. Now, the bad kind is chronic inflammation, and that's where inflammation becomes systemic. That is where you have invading pathogens or inva invading things like heavy metals or toxins that are not meant to be in the body and look at as foreign and the body is going to try to attack that. The thing is when it's systemic, it's as if you've had that increased blood flow and where the white blood cells are arming themselves, natural killer cell cytokines throughout the entire body. Now, for the short term, maybe it's a good thing, but with chronic inflammation, you also get chronic disease, autoimmune disease, where the inflammatory system, the immune system is overactive. That's never a good thing. So let's talk about some of the things that can lead to inflammation and therefore what we can do about that. So the first thing that we talk about always when we talk about inflammation, chronic inflammation, systemic inflammation and chronic disease is the gut. So when the gut, with the gut health, with the mucosal barrier, when the, um, it's highly permeable, what we call leaky gut, what happens is things can leak out from the gut and get into the body in general. That's never a good thing. So how can we seal this leaky gut? How can we seal the mucosal barrier? So a few things that you can do right away. You could get something that has L-glutamine, which helps support the gut cells, uh, DGL, the glycerized licorice, you've got aloe, slippery elm, these things help build, rebuild the mucosal barrier. That's while you try to figure out what is going on because you can just seal the barrier and then if you still have the pathogen still there, whether it's bacterial overgrowth or candida or um, harmful bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, you have to get rid of those and you have to compete against them with good probiotics and the good microbiome. So the first thing that I always recommend is to do an elimination diet. So you wanna eliminate the things that are seen to the, are, that the body senses as, as foreign. So it could be dairy sensitivity, it could be a gluten sensitivity, sugar, obviously, I'm not, you know, we can mention that a thousand times, it's sugar. Um, it could also be things like peanuts. It could be things like soy, eggs. So you really have to f figure out through the elimination diet, but eliminating things at least for you know four to six weeks and then bringing them back in. And you can figure out what exactly you are responding to and try not to eat those foods or at least cycle them so you're not doing them so often. And then um, it could be bacterial overgrowth. You want to go on a low FODMAP diet. These are things which you really, really have to test out through doing the diet yourself and figure out what works for you. And during that process, you can seal the mucosal barrier, digestive enzymes help break down the food better, and so on. Okay, so that's the gut. Um, the next thing we talk about, um, we're gonna talk about different supplements and different nutrients that you can get in everyday foods, which are very beneficial, which if you go to the Eastern countries, this is how they eat. So let's talk about curcumin. So curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric. Now, if you go to a country like India, they literally put turmeric on everything. That's cur in curry, there's turmeric. So they're getting high amounts of this stuff, which is very, very anti-inflammatory. However, um, in our type of cooking, we don't tend to use turmeric every single meal. So um, if you're just doing turmeric once in a while, it's just not going to be as effective. Turmeric, the curcumin, is not very absorbable. 
So you want to get a highly absorbable form. So the one that I like to use is called Mariva. So different companies like Thorn, Pure Encapsulations, they carry um, this Mariva, which is much more highly absorbable than your just average turmeric supplement. So I like to start uh, with Mariva, 500 milligrams twice a day, um, but you have to see what works for you. The only precaution I'll give with you, I'll give for you is that if you have gallstones, do not use curcumin. If you're on a blood thinner, do not use curcumin because it'll make the blood thinner. So those are the two, probably the two precautions where you shouldn't use curcumin. Otherwise, it's a pretty, pretty good supplement. And let's talk about what, how curcumin affects inflammation. So it, curcumin increases something called PPAR, which is proliferator activator receptor gene. So what happens is when you increase PPAR, this results in a reduction of inflammatory pathways such as NFKB. So aside from this, due to the reduction, as a side point, due to reduction of this pathway, this inflammatory pathway and other pathways, which we won't mention, but there's plenty of pathways where it reduces inflammation, but you also, a side benefit is that it also induces apoptosis. Apoptosis is this death of senescent cells, meaning cells that are really not doing anything in the body. The thing is when these cells grow, they create tumors. Curcumin, turmeric, can prevent, can, can, shut, can shut down these senescent cells and apoptosis is the death of these cells. And so these cells don't hang around and therefore you can prevent and you can destroy cancer. So a really nice side benefit of curcumin. Another thing you wanna look for is vitamin D. So you need to check to see if you are deficient or if you have insufficiency of vitamin D. Deficiency is um, anything below level of 30, um, but we like to see optimal of 60 to 80 in vitamin D. Why? Vitamin D we know is very good for reabsorbing calcium um, and therefore good for the bones, but the main thing is sodium being called a, a vitamin, it's really a hormone. It exists in the body, it's con you know, you, you convert sunlight but unfortunately we don't get enough sunlight, so we need to actually take vitamin D or eat vitamin D rich foods. Um, mushrooms are very good, salmon is really good, but still, I just don't see people getting enough vitamin D. They're usually um, insufficient or even deficient because we just don't get outside enough. So what does vitamin D do? Vitamin D, the main thing it does, it balances the Th1 and Th2 pathways. These are, this is really the balance of pro and anti-inflammatory pathways. So study, many studies have been shown that it prevents autoimmune disease and in some studies even can reverse autoimmune disease. So we see this in multiple, major studies have been done with multiple sclerosis and ulcerative colitis, but many autoimmune diseases has been shown where it's a direct, not just a correlation, but causation with vitamin D deficiency and multiple sclerosis. If you, want to, if you want to go see a paper, so you could go on our blog, and um, we have a paper there that um, I wrote about the relationship between vitamin D and multiple sclerosis, so check that out. So your vitamin D level should be between 60 and 80 optimally. Number four, so let's go with bioflavonoids. So bioflavonoids are extremely anti-inflammatory. Um, these are phytonutri phytonutrients that can be found in the peels of citrus fruits like lemons and oranges. Um, and you may know the word, you know, like the terms quercetin or rutin, these are bioflavonoids. Other bioflavonoids, rosemary, in rosemary, we have something called rosmarinic acid. In ginger, we have something called gingerols. Cayenne pepper, capsaicin. And this is a favorite one of mine is boswellic acid from Boswellia serrata, or you might better know it as frankincense. So, Frankincense or, uh, or Boswellia can be used externally as an essential oil, or you can find supplements that have Boswellia in them. Many studies have shown the benefits of Boswellia alone. However, um, we've seen even greater benefits when you actually combine with curcumin, ginger, and ashwagandha, or withinia. Um, so what does Boswellia do? Boswellia inhibits the synthesis of inflammatory enzyme called 5-lipooxygenase. So that's why you'll see pure encapsulations, they actually write five locks in. That's, that's, their, that's their, um, their brand name for their Boswellia, but it's really because it inhibits something called 5-lipooxygenase, same thing that, that quercetin does. 
Um, what happens is, because it does this, it also inhibits leukotrienes, TNF-alpha, and IL-1-beta. These are all inflammatory markers. And this is, a, Baswell is fantastic. Why? Because it does the same thing as, as ibuprofen, um, except it doesn't have the side effects that ibuprofen does. Ibuprofen, even though people take it for joints, people take Advil for joint pain, it actually can start degrading the joints, believe it or not. It can actually cause articular damage um, just because of a specific pathway that it has because what happens is you um, upregulate these glucosaminoglycans while Boswellia can reduce, reduce the degradation of gl uh, glucosaminoglycans. So ibuprofen, um, ibuprofen degrades the glycosaminoglycans which protect which pre so let me turn that again. So the Boswellia actually reduces, Boswellia reduces the degradation of uh, the glycoaminoglycans versus the ibuprofen does the total opposite. So it starts degrading the, the it causes articular damage or in other words, uh, joint, it degrades the joints, okay? Number five, another, another thing to reduce inflammation is getting foods high in antioxidants like berries, chocolates, green tea. So this is going to reduce the free radicals. You reduce the free radicals and reduce oxidation, you are going to get less inflammation. It's just, it's, it's just, how, this is just how the mechanism works. Number six, you've got EPA and DHA. So EPA and DHA, preferably to get it from algae. Why? Because um, Allergal oil is very, very high in DHA. Um, EPA and DHA are omega-3s. So D DHA has been found that DHA more than EPA can actually uh, reduce inflammatory markers. So things like C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, interleukin-18, TNF-alpha. So all these inflammatory markers can be reduced through DHA because omega-3s are known as your anti-inflammatory uh, fatty acids, while omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. So you have to maintain the imbalance of omega-3 to omega-6. But when we talk about inflammation specifically, you want to make sure that you get enough DHA. So DHA can be found in algae oil. There's no need really to necessarily go to fish oil if you don't have to. So let's just go over, let's review. So number one, we've got is pay attention to gut health. So you can use a supplement that has L-glutamine, um, deglycerized licorice, aloe vera, slippery elm, to just rebuild the mucosa. And at the same time, you figure out what exactly is going on. Is it bacterial overgrowth? Is it candida? Um, are you just sensitive to certain foods and you have to do an elimination diet? That's something you have to figure out. So that's number one. Number two, we mentioned was curcumin. Number three, we mentioned was vitamin D. Number four, bioflavonoids, especially, um, you know, quercetin, rutin, uh, rosemary acid, ginger, uh, cayenne pepper, cayenne capsaicin, and a really great one is Boswellia to go along with this curcumin and this and um, and ashwagandha and quercetin and ginger. So really, really good stuff. Number five, eating foods high in antioxidants, and you know, antioxidants just to be clear are things that contain lots of vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, phyto, any phytonutrients. They're just going to prevent this, the free radicals from breaking down the cells, less breaking down the cells, less inflammation. Now, and finally, number six is omega-3s. So get yourself plenty of DHA from algae oil. Um, and you, know, you could also get flaxseed oil um, it doesn't convert that well, but also beneficial. And listen, fish oil also has is great, more EPA and D than DHA, so I would say stick to the algae oil. Um, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below, but please subscribe. Thank you very much. Have a great day.